Dr. Knight, thank you for coming here. We really do appreciate it. And thank you for your complimentary words of this union being a bastion of free speech. With that same principle of free speech in mind, don't you think that I or anyone should therefore have the right to go to a Muslim country and proclaim the Christian gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Brother asked the question, with the same right of freedom of speech, doesn't he have the right to proclaim the Christian Bible in any Muslim country? Brother, as we know today, all the Muslim countries per se do not follow Quran and the Hadith in the true sense. There are many Muslim countries, some may be close to Islam, some may not be close to Islam. Depending upon each country, they may have their own law. So what you have to do, you have to ask that particular country which does not permit you to preach your gospel, what is the reason that they don't want to preach your gospel? Dr. Knight, thank you very much for your talk. The question I have is you profess to be a man of peace. You've spoken very eloquently about the idea of peace in Islam. Peace is written in front of your microphone as you stand there. And I agree with you in, in many senses. But my question is why then is your message still seen as so controversial? Why are there figures within the Islamic world, why are there fellow Islamic clerics who see your message and still believe that you are wrong? Why? I mean, you, you've claimed that the Home Secretary has banned you from this country because of a, a sort of media conspiracy. But why is there a broader sense of discontent with your message? The brother asked a very good question. That why if I'm a man of peace and I speak about peace, some people are against me, some Muslims, some non-Muslim, the Home Secretary. Brother, you have to understand that any person who's popular, they're bound to be people who are against him. Irrespective whether the popular person is doing good work or bad work. And the best example I can give you, that today, according to Michael H. Hart, he wrote a book saying, the 100 most influential people in the world history. Though he's a Christian, he put number one most influential human being as Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Today, do you know, though Muslims consider him to be the most important and the most influential person in history, there are many non-Muslims who think the same. But today, if we analyze the maximum books, written against any human being on the face of the earth, it is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The second person he named in his list was Isaac Newton, but because he's not a common man for common human being, he's a scientist, the third person on his list was Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. If we analyze today, the second person in human history who has maximum books written against him, it is Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Based on this argument, do I have to agree that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, they were not good. What we have to realize, when a person gets popular, there are bound to be people against him. And according to the Home Department of UK, when I had come in the year 2009, I was informed by reliable sources, that according to the Home Department of UK, the most popular Islamic satellite channel in the world is Peace TV and the most watched Islamic satellite channel in UK is also Peace TV. Not only is it watched by Muslims, but even watched by non-Muslims. The same report said that the most popular Islamic speaker in the world is Dr. Zakir Naik and the most popular Islamic speaker in UK is also Dr. Naik. That's the reason the Home Department was requesting me that can I reach out to those Muslims which the UK government cannot. But now, because of the change of government, what I feel, it was more of a political move rather than a legal move. And as maybe they wanted someone popular so that they could pass the message that we are tough against Muslims. And that's the reason what we feel 
that we have more faith in the judicial system rather than the political system. I think it was mainly because of popularity and it was mainly a political move rather than a legal move. And inshallah, God willing, we feel that this exclusion order would be reversed by the Court of Appeal, hopefully. Thank you. Uh, my name I'm a, I'm a lawyer, a historian, and also a theologian. You gave a very excellent exposition of uh, the Quran and Islam, but uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all Abrahamic faiths. A Jew could have said the same thing or oh, there's almost the same things that you said by quoting uh, the Quran, sorry, it's called quoting the, the Torah and the Talmud. A Christian would have said almost everything you said by quoting both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I do not know whether we should be trying to say one religion is superior or more truthful than another, and if we do go down that line, what does that lead to? Uh, that's what led to the crusades, etc. etc. You mentioned about justice and peace. Of course, the Christian Bible mentions more, there are more verses about justice and peace than there are about the Holy, Holy Spirit. And of course, Christians were pacifists until 313. So, what is the difference between what you are saying and Judaism and Christianity, and what would that lead to? But that's a very good question, and I do agree with him that if you read the Torah, the books of Judaism, the books of Christianity, you will find verses of peace. Never in my lecture ever did I say that any religion is against peace. Or any religion is in favor of terrorism. I always said all religions are against terrorism. What I made one statement in my speech that the verse of the Quran, chapter 5, verse number 32, this verse, which is so emphatic, I do not find a similar verse in any other scripture because I'm a student of comparative religion saying that if you kill one innocent human being, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And if you save one innocent human being, it is as though you have saved the whole of humanity. It was only one verse. So that generally, I do agree that most of the religion, almost all, they speak about peace. That's the reason Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. If you read the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 36, when he goes to the upper room, he says, when he wishes the apostle, Shalom Alaikum, which means same, peace be upon you in Hebrew. So the greetings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him too, when he met the people was Shalom Alaikum, which meant same in Arabic, Assalamu Alaikum, may peace be on you. Regarding you saying that one religion is superior to the other religion, I believe Almighty God sent only one religion. He has not sent different religions. What the Quran says, he has made human beings into different tribes, different colors different languages so that they may recognize each other not they may despise each other the only religion that god has sent to all his messengers whether it be moses whether it be jesus peace be upon him moses peace be upon him muhammad peace be upon him. it was to submit their will to almighty god i believe all these messengers right from adam noah moses jesus muhammad peace be upon them all all of them brought the same message that believe in one God and worship him alone and only him and submit your will to that almighty God. Hope that answers the question. Good afternoon, Dr. Nike. Um, my name is Izzy Westbury. I'm the secretary here at the Oxford Union. 
Uh, I have a very short question to ask. Um, you talk about the hijab being something that serves to protect women. Surely it's, so, it's extremely patronizing and degrading to prevent a woman from making that decision for herself. How can you answer that? What's the question, sister? Can you repeat the question? I said, in your speech, you talk about the hijab being something that serves to protect a woman. But how is it not extremely patronizing and degrading in not allowing a woman to make that decision herself? Sister, I posed a very good question that when I say that hijab is required for women, isn't it not degrading for the woman to patronize it? Isn't it uh, degrading? If you read the Quran, the Quran and Islam has prescribed hijab. That means the woman should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. This is for the modesty. And it is not only mentioned in the Quran, it is also mentioned in the Bible. If you read the Bible in the first Timothy, chapter number two, verse number nine, it says that women should be dressed up with shamefacedness. They should be dressed up with sobriety and should not wear braided hair or of gold or pearls. It's further mentioned in the first Corinthians. Chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 11. The woman that does not cover her hair, head, then she dishonors her head. Her head should be shaved off. Anyway, I don't agree with this. I'm just quoting you from the Bible. Same way if you go to the Vedas, it says that the woman should cover the head. So all the religious scriptures, they talk about the woman covering there. It is for modesty. It is not to degrade the woman. And if you analyze, there was an allegation made against me, saying that Dr. Zakir Naik says that... Uh, that if they don't wear hijab, you know, that if you wear western clothes, there are chances the women will be raped. It is a misquotation again. What I said, that if women were revealing clothes, they have more chances of being raped. What I was doing, the same newspaper, Sunday Times, which spoke against me, one year before, on the March of 9th, 2009, Sunday Times carried an article. In Britain, one out of seven feel that the woman who were sexy revealing clothes, she should be hit. I'm sorry, I don't agree with it. This is the statistics that was given in the Sunday Times on the 9th of March 2009, that in Britain, one out of seven Britishers believe that the woman who were revealing and sexy clothes should be hit. I disagree with this. Furthermore, one more article came in 2005. In the same newspaper, Sunday Times, it said that 26% of the Britishers, they feel that wearing revealing clothes is partially or totally responsible for the rape. So what I say that the more modest you are dressed up, you are respected more. So Islam has prescribed the modest hijab for the woman not to degrade her but to uplift her. I do agree there may be cultural differences. Islam cannot force anyone to adopt it. There are cultural differences. For example, I'll give you an example. That some, some societies, what they feel, that even looking at a woman is immodest. Some societies feel looking is no problem, but touching a woman is immodest. Some of the society feel shaking hand is no problem. Some societies feel kissing no problem. Some societies feel doing anything as long as both agree is no problem. Different societies and different cultures have got different rules and regulation. When I went to America, while I was giving a talk, one of the Americans told me, you Eastern woman, you are immodest. I was shocked. So I said, why do you call the Eastern woman immodest? He told me, you Eastern woman, you expose your belly. So in America and Western country, exposing belly is immodesty. In India, exposing belly is not immodesty, wearing shorts is immodesty. So what I've realized, sister, there's different culture, there's different system. Islam cannot force anyone to adopt. It's clearly mentioned in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter, chapter number 2, verse number 256, like Rafiddin, there is no compulsion in religion. But if some women want to adopt the hijab because they feel modest, and they feel respected, I feel no other woman should disagree. And when I've been to UK, I've seen hundreds and thousands of women who do cover their hair and who feel that they are uplifted because of this modesty. Hope that answers the question.